Introduction to Dynamical Systems Part 1 Definition of Dynamical System The lecture is given by Natalia Janssen from Loughborough University, United Kingdom. The working principles of many man-made devices, as well as of biological systems, are based on their ability to evolve spontaneously. One of the most famous evolving man-made devices is a mechanical pendulum clock, often called grandfather clock. When it is probably properly wound, the pendulum is swinging all by itself, in the sense that nobody dictates the pendulum when to swing to the left or to the right, and with what amplitude. Now take a biological system. For example, this is the heart of a 50 kilogram Danish land gray land race pig. Uh, while sitting inside the body, the heart beats spontaneously, and again, no external manipulator dictates the heart when to contract next. This applies to all hearts of all animals. To describe spontaneously evolving devices mathematically, we need certain mathematical tools. If we make an assumption that our devices or organs evolve in continuous time, and if we assume that their states are changing continuously, then their suitable models will typically take the form of ordinary differential equations. Of that form. An abbreviation is ODE. An ODE is described as a function capital F whose arguments are time, t, x, the variable that changes with time, and several of the time derivatives of this variable. And this function is typically equated to zero. It is convenient to introduce the following notation. Instead of writing dx by dt each time, it is convenient to write x dot, and we use dots up to the time derivatives uh, up to the third order. Uh, for time derivatives of nth order, when n is greater than 3, we uh, write the order n inside the brackets and put it in the sub superscript of variable x. Now the general ordinary differential equation of order n can be rewritten as follows. A very nice example of such an ODE is a famous van der Poel oscillator, which describes uh, the behavior of voltage in a certain electronic circuit whose sketch is given in the left-hand side of this figure. Variable x is the unknown variable which is equivalent to voltage after the change of variables. You can immediately see that this equation is nonlinear because of the term x squared multiplied by x dot. Here, epsilon and omega zero are some parameters. In the right-hand side of this slide, a uh, red line shows the solution of this equation obtained numerically. Let us consider a simpler version of ordinary differential equation. And in particular, let us consider an ODE which is linear, homogeneous, and autonomous. This equation has the form shown in the slide. This equation is homogeneous because the right-hand side of this equation is identically equal to zero, and this equation is autonomous because the coefficients a n, a n minus one, and throughout to a1 and a0 are all constants, which means they do not depend on time. Equations of this form can be solved analytically, exactly, and quite easily, and their solutions 
uh, can be represented as combinations of certain exponential functions or combinations of sines and cosines. Consider an example of such an equation, and this example describes small oscillations of a mechanical pendulum. This equation is an equation for the angle the pendulum makes with the vertical. So this angle theta is evolving with time. The solution to this equation is uh, represented here as a sinusoidal function of time and the frequency, the angular frequency of this sine is equal to the uh, square root of the factor uh, g over l in the ODE. Phi is some initial phase shift and theta zero uh, can be found from initial conditions. Please note that even linear ordinary differential equations, uh, which are non-homogeneous and or uh, which have coefficients depending on time, might not be solvable with that ease as the equation which we considered just now. What about more complex equations? In practice, realistic models of real devices or organs have the following feature. They are nonlinear. They must be nonlinear if they need to be realistic. Which means that their models should be represented by some nonlinear ODE. And such nonlinear ordinary differential equations, unfortunately, very rarely have exact analytic solutions in the closed form. Almost never. Look at the same example, Van der Poel equation describing an electronic circuit. Well, this is obviously a nonlinear equation, which can be solvable only numerically. And let us ask a question which is uh, very pertinent here. If realistic models of real devices or organs cannot be solved analytically and exactly, what's the point even writing down these models? Are they completely useless? Fortunately, the situation is not quite hopeless as it might seem. Uh, we will consider three general approaches to deal with nonlinear differential equations. The first approach is kind of obvious, is to solve this equation numerically. An advantage of this approach is that if the solution to the OD exists in principle, then numerically it can be revealed. And the disadvantage is that, unfortunately, numerical solutions can only be approximate. They will never be exact. The second approach uh, concerns uh, geometrical methods. And uh, it is thanks to the uh, great breakthrough which occurred in the 19th century, mostly thanks to a great mathematician, Henri Poincaré. Poincaré proposed to represent solutions of ordinary differential equations as certain uh, trajectories, geometric sets, in certain spaces, which are called phase spaces. This way, if the solution is a geometrical object, we can consider the behavior of a uh, nonlinear ordinary differential equation uh, using some geometrical approaches which rely a lot on visualization and on some visual information. The advantage of such methods is that uh, the properties of solutions can be revealed at a qualitative level at least. However, there is a disadvantage that such methods require uh, some form of visualization or imagination uh, in, a, in the space uh, whose dimension can be one, two, and at most three. 
Unfortunately, when this space has larger dimension, which will be the case for higher order nonlinear differential equations, this approach is not quite efficient because we cannot visualize such solutions. So for higher order ODEs, this approach might not be quite appealing. And there is a third approach, uh, which combines the geometrical methods with some analytical tools and with some knowledge about the behavior of the physical prototype of our equations, which is available typically from experiment. Uh, it is essential here that uh, such an approach really requires additional knowledge in physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, and maybe in some other related disciplines. Uh, without this knowledge, it, is, uh, it might be really difficult uh, to make any assumptions, any specific assumptions regarding the properties of solutions of our differential equations. So this approach requires multidisciplinarity. All the three approaches considered here require introduction of a certain mathematical concept called a dynamical system. A dynamical system has two components. We will consider autonomous dynamical systems in the first instance. The first component of a dynamical system is the phase space. To introduce the phase space, we need to identify some quantities which change with time. These quantities are called variables, or more precise, precisely state variables, and their number should be sufficient to describe the state of the system at any time moment t. Now let us introduce the following coordinate axis for all the state variables involved x1, x2, x3, and we can continue to xn. Let us construct a vector from the state variables of this system. The vector is denoted as a thick letter x. Every state vector is represented as a single point in this space. And because uh, all variables will change with time, the vector x will change in time too, which means its representative point will change. Like this. Now we can introduce the phase space as the space of all possible states of the given system. The second component of a dynamical system is evolution operator. What is it about? If we represent the dynamical system in the following form, it means that we write down n equations, which are first order ordinary differential equations. Each equation corresponds uh, to the phase variables introduced on the previous slide. For each variable, we introduce the quantity, the rate of change of this variable, uh, which depends on the current state of the system. The same system can be rewritten in a more compact vector notation as shown here. Now consider the phase space of this dynamical system. For simplicity, we show a three-dimensional space. And of course, every state is represented as a single point. But it is convenient to introduce uh, a special vector whose components are formed by the values of functions f1, f2, and etc. up to fn. Uh, which take certain values at the given state. This, function, uh, this set of functions form a vector, which is shown by green in this slide. 
This is called the phase velocity vector or just the velocity vector. As time goes by, the state of the system changes and the velocity vectors are generally different for different st uh, states. The full collection of the velocity vectors corresponding to all possible states of the dynamical system is called the velocity vector field. It is important to appreciate that it is the velocity vector field which effectively dictates the system how to evolve. During evolution, the phase point will be following a, what is called a phase trajectory and the velocity vector uh, vectors will be tangent or they will be touching the phase trajectory at each point. Let us consider an example. It is the same Van der Poel oscillator as we considered before, but here I rename the quantity x by the quantity z for convenience. Now do the following. We now re rename z as x and we introduce a new variable y, which will be the first time derivative of the quantity z, which is the same as the first time derivative of the quantity x. And now we can express the second time derivative of z as the first derivative of y. This way we effectively introduced two state variables x and y, and we can write down uh, the system above, the ordinary differential above, as a system of two first order ordinary differential equations, which in fact define the dynamical system. Let us denote the right hand sides of this equation, of these equations as F1 and F2. The figure here shows the phase space of the given system, which appears to be the phase plane because the dimension of this system is 2. X and Y are our state variables. Red arrows show the velocity vectors and one of such vectors is shown here. And the blue line shows the phase trajectory uh, which follows uh, the instructions obtained fr from the velocity vector field. Let us now introduce a very convenient concept of a phase portrait. Strictly speaking, the phase portrait uh, is a collection of all phase trajectories in the phase space of the given dynamical system. However, uh, how many trajectories are there? There are infinitely many trajectories which can start from infinitely many uh, initial conditions. We cannot uh, depict infinitely many trajectories, obviously. So in practice, to plot the phase portrait, we really need to depict only a few typical trajectories, uh, which are qualitatively different from each other. The figure on this slide shows a typical phase plot for a mechanical pendulum without friction. So if we follow these arrows, we can roughly predict the behavior uh, of the system, which is what we know, which, which is what we want. I would like to acknowledge professional and technical assistance, assistance from several people Olga Sosnovtseva, Dmitry Pasnov, Anastasia Niganova, Stefan Settler, Alexander Balanov and the Center for Online and Blended Learning in the University of Copenhagen, Denmark. <laughs>